sugar and spice and everything nice and complex gender play and beautiful boys in love and the dark, daunting depths of emotional realism. That's what shoujo manga is made of. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. In the introductory video on manga, I briefly discussed the nature of manga publishing. That is, that while manga exists in pretty much all styles and genres, the primary category for publishing and marketing purposes is gender, and not genre. Now, the overwhelming majority of mainstream manga is categorized first as either shonen manga, boys manga, or shoujo manga, girls manga. Well, readers and creators cross the gender line, and subgenres like action, sci-fi, fantasy, sports, and more exist in both categories, there are some tendencies broadly associated with them. The most obvious is, of course, the gender of the main characters. Shonen tends to follow male main characters, while shoujo tends to follow female main characters. Shonen manga tends towards action-heavy stories, and humor, especially physical humor, tends to play a pretty big role. Visually, shonen manga tends to have bolder lines and more pronounced panel borders. It also tends to produce the best sellers. Now, many critics theorize this is because young women are traditionally more willing to cross over than boys and men. That is, women are willing to read both shoujo and shonen manga than men and boys are willing to read both. Hard data is difficult to come by here, but my experience anecdotally seems to back this up. Now, regardless of the reasons why, Weekly Shonen Jump has dominated bestseller lists by an order of magnitude for ages. While 23 of the top 50 magazines are aimed at girls, seems about half and half split, only one shoujo magazine, Chow, has broken into the top 10 with any regularity. Despite that, as the intro implied, shoujo manga is the focus of our conversation today. And where shonen manga tends to be about boys in action, shoujo focuses on girls and women. And while the female characters are often action heroes, think Sailor Moon, she indeed fights evil by moonlight. Shoujo manga also tends to take breaks to focus on characters' relationships and their inner lives and emotions. Visually, shoujo artists tend to draw their characters in more idealized forms and lively with large sparkling eyes. Shoujo also tends to use what I call emotional imagery. Flowers, symbols, lines, and patterns that aren't meant to be taken as literally there, but instead as metaphors representing the emotional and mental state of the characters. And finally, shoujo manga tends to have what I'll call porous borders. That is, characters and imagery often overlap panel borders, and the borders themselves can be lightly drawn to non-existent. Now these feely parts of shoujo manga are kind of difficult to describe if you haven't read much, but they have a huge impact on the way that you read these texts. In his piece, The Acoustics of Manga, Robert Peterson calls them narrative erotics, inspired by Susan Sontag's description of the erotics of art. Now, this isn't about being sexy, though it can be that too. It's about trying to achieve embodiment and sensuality. Most units of narrative are concerned with meaning that establishes temporal or causal relationships between events. Narrative erotics do not move the plot forward more than allow the action to be realized or actuated. Susan Sontag wrote about the need to look beyond meaning to the erotics of art, how art is embodied with emotional force and presence that cannot be entirely reduced to meaning. Narrative erotics create an animated interior for the story to live within, allowing it to become more evocative and memorable. This presence is not in opposition to meaning. Rather, it creates a space for meaning to accrue. I really like this explanation because I think these visuals are often dismissed as meaningless sparkles and pretty stuff. But instead, Peterson encourages us to think about what different kinds of meaning, besides just imparting information, and what different kinds of experiences this imagery encourages its readers. Now, interestingly, a lot of these things that define shoujo manga today, including narrative erotics, were pioneered by a small but determined group of young women in the 1960s and 70s. But in order to talk about them, we need to maybe start a little bit further back. So the vast majority of shoujo manga in the 1950s, that so-called golden age, was written by men. And most were either adventure stories, identical to shonen manga, only with female characters, 
or stereotypically feminine stories drawing heavily from fairy tales and fantasy, princess stuff. Tezuka's Ribbon Knight, which we talked about last week, is a more complex version of this character and inspired many later shoujo artists. However, by contemporary standards, there are a lot of ways in which Sapphire is a really one-dimensional character. One of the most important visual influences on early manga, the big eyes, the pretty clothes, sparklies, all that stuff, was a male painter named Makoto Takahashi. It's not that these early manga pioneers were inherently bad. Ribbon Knight has a lot of cool stuff in it. It's just that they weren't by women. And so a lot of what constructed femininity for girls reading manga was coming from dudes, which, you know. And it's worth noting that there were a few important exceptions in this era, including women like Toshiko Ueda, Masako Watanabe, Miyako Maki, and Hideko Mizuno. Mizuno's trajectory is especially interesting because she began as one of Tezuka's assistants. Her early work was the sort of fairy tale stuff of early shoujo, but she's best known for Fire, a series about an American rock star named Aaron Browning, which debuted in 1969. Aaron wasn't a good boy or a boy next door, but a rebel. And while he ultimately suffers for his unconventional choices, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, leading some to call it a morality tale, Fire featured the first sexually explicit scenes in mainstream manga after World War II and showed its readers all the details of his seedy lifestyle with some gusto, challenging notions of what women were supposed to want to read about. Mizuno was a pioneer, and Fire was being published at the same time as the rise of the Hana no Niju Yonen Gumi, the Magnificent Year 24 group. But without the step that Mizuno took to get to publishing Fire, it's likely the Year 24 group wouldn't have had the space to create their work. So, what the heck is the Year 24 group? So to start with, year 24 refers to 24 Showa, the 24th year of the reign of Emperor Hirohito, or 1949. And that's about when most of these young women were born. So that by the mid 60s or early 70s, this group of young female artists had come of age reading manga and were ready to start publishing their own shoujo manga on their own terms. These women are the magnificent year 24 group. So what did they do? Well, first, their stories emphasized real life. They wrote a lot of everyday romance and coming of age stories instead of fantasy and fairy tales. It's the year 24 group that began to use the panels that emphasize emotion and atmosphere and not just to move plot or show passage of time. And they're the ones that crystallized and perfected the visual style that portrays those lithe, super tall bodies and super fine, sketchy lines. Another genre they innovated was shonen ai, that is, boys love. To call it gay romance elides some of the complicated representational issues at play, including the fact that a lot of the artists themselves admitted they'd never met any gay men. In the early days, shonen ai was often tragic in nature and rarely consummated, so very different, say, from Yuri on Ice. These kinds of early shonen ai are perhaps best exemplified by Motohagio's Heart of Thomas. The story takes place in an all-boys school in Germany, where the main character, Yuli, is haunted by the death of Thomas, a younger student whose suicide letter declares his unrequited love for Yuli. This struggle is compounded when Eric, a new student nearly identical to Thomas, arrives at the school. It ends with, spoiler, Yuli becoming a priest. Questioning desire is not enough. Complicated gender play was also common among the texts of the Year 24 group. Ryoko Ikeda's series Rose of Versailles largely focuses on Oscar Francois de Jarget, a woman who becomes commander of the Royal Guard in the French Revolution and is responsible for Marie Antoinette. Oscar plays a man's role in society, but not as a man, as Oscar. She's in love with her best friend Andre, and half of the court ladies are in love with Oscar. Meanwhile, Oscar has to deal with political awakenings and political machinations and, oh yeah, that whole French Revolution thing. It's great stuff. The year 24 group is an unofficial category to describe a movement, though many of these young women did work together and know each other. As such, there's no official listing of the year 24 group. However, most folks will include Ryoku Ikeda and Motohagio, who I've mentioned, as well as Yumiko Oshima, Keiko Takimiya, Minori Kimura, and Yasuko Aoike. Whoever they are, it's safe to say that these women are responsible for something really special changing the visual landscape of the world. 
Shoujo manga today and everything that it's influenced flow at least in part from the work that these young women did when they took the chance to create work that they liked, about things that they cared about, even if it looked different than anything else they were reading at the time. And you can see its effects everywhere. And that's pretty badass. See you next time.